Welcome to the Porsche Club Insider, your one stop for all things Porsche and PCA. Here's your host, Vu Gwynn, and the Insider Crew. So here we are, Manny. Looks like uh, an intimate podcast is on order today. <laughs> I, I, I love Damon, and I, I know he loves being on the podcast. But the email from him this morning where so Damon's at his house uh, uh, watching the uh, workers uh, uh, waterproof his basement. Oh. And so they had to get uh, something with Jack Cameron because he said, uh, I can call in and I can mute when I'm not speaking. There's just Jack Cameron going on in the background. <laughs> and I, I, I thought, is this a joke? Or is this... <laughs> That's some serious work to to have jackhammers going in your basement. So anyways, he's uh, Damon is not here with us. So Manny, follow my lead on this because I think you'll know where I'm going. So I would like to say Yindi Pangrab to episode 62. Where am I going with that? It sounds like Hindu. It's Thai. Thai, huh? It's Thai because we found out what? Oh, we were number one <laughs> in Thailand, at least for Did you have your coffee week. yet this morning? <laughs> we were number one in Thailand. That's right. For automo automotive podcast. So shout out to them. Hopefully I, I pronounced it correctly. Uh, episode 62 today. Uh, Robert is here. He has to be because without him, none of this would work. So thank you, Robert, for being here. Um, the hottest news, news on the street, R.S. Spider. And I think it caught some people from surprise because I... Uh, I just said on the Chesapeake uh, chat uh, app, I said, um, uh, 6.01 p.m., Porsche's dropping a new model. And they're like, oh, I didn't see anything about this. And I thought, well, of course you didn't see anything about it because uh, you don't know about it. Right. <laughs> I just know about it because I clicked on the little NDA uh, thing so we could look at the pictures. So the RS Spider. Um, well, like uh, Damon wrote in his article, I, I think like 10 years ago, you would never have thought that Porsche would have done this to the mm -hmm. Boxster. Um, the ultimate iteration. It's like a GT4 RS. Uh, it is not like, it is pretty yeah. much, right? I, I mean, it, it, yeah. I think the There's suspension's a little, a little, a little softer, softer, which little is softer. fine, which I think is perfectly fine because it's actually more suited to what this is, uh, like a touring mm -hmm. type of RS. Um, uh, obviously, they're gonna sell every one of them. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be ADMs on them all oh, over yeah. the place. Uh, you know, people can whine and complain, but it's pretty cool that a uh, factory is building something like this. So you know my buddy Peter, mm -hmm. you know, and he has a Spider and GT2 RS, and he's been asking me, and it's been killing me that I couldn't say anything. And you know, my trip, my trip to Vaisaka last year, I, I saw a number of things, and they always tell me to, you know, not completely <laughs> capture what I'm what I'm seeing and, and of course uh, you know under NDA I'm never able to to share until it's 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 public but um, man I, I knew this was coming I knew you guys would think this is crazy amazing if you do any kind of search or keep up on Porsche news or you can watch this podcast we're always posting pictures of the spy photo so mm -hmm. it's not like a complete surprise I got a complete say, the 935 last year was a surprise yeah I don't think any of us were really expecting uh, that, but this was uh, this has been t been testing at the Nurburgring. It's um, it was pretty well known. Uh, the detail is, is what's cool that they've done with the car, um, with the intakes. I mean, the yeah. intakes are mm -hmm. incredible, right, right by, next uh, to your seat. head. <laughs> yeah, it's got to sound incredible to top down at full song. It's um, so. Here's my question: really, with, really with, fascinating with the photos, um, and if you look at the top, so. The top on the the most recent um, spider is quite concealed and and puts up and down like a, a, a typical typical um, top. That's but it's not power. But this top seems like it goes back to the nine eight seven top. It seems like it's not a fully sealed cabin because I was looking at the photos and the the pieces behind the the seat didn't look like it was. Well, the 97 was fully sealed. It was right. just fully sealed like a Jeep. Right, like a Jeep, exactly. And I think this one looks like it's kind of back to that. So I, I don't know. I I, I don't re recall seeing that that piece when I was at Vysok to know that if that's the case. Because the, the most recent Spider it seals up like a convertible yes, you would expect not, uh, as opposed to Jeep-like. And I think that's what will make this car even more iconic. And that's what makes the 987 Spider. I think 
20 years from now, that'll be the collectible one because, it, as I like to call it, it's the most convoluted top they've ever made. But that's what's cool. Exactly. That's, that's what's what, cool. Uh, yeah. That's what separates it from just being a regular boxer. Yeah. And uh, for those of you that have had a, a Jeep, and I had a Jeep YJ with a um, a top, you know, to keep the, the sun off of you, but having open around you, it's cool because, you know, the air, the ventilates, and um, that's something that's very unique to the 987, very unique to, like, Jeep people know about that. So if this car also has that, like you said, I think that will definitely make it one of one of the more special ones. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, we know it's going to be, a, like I said, an instant sale success. Uh, we'll start seeing them next year sometime. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll get the chance to drive one. It'll be. Uh, so the motor, cool the motor in the car is. 493 horsepower i think it's like 16 or 30 pounds lighter than you know the other spiders and boxsters the ducktail in the back is what i love the but ducktail yeah yeah it's uh very very aggressive now how about what are your thoughts on pdk only i wish for this they would have put the six speed because they're softening suspension um yeah. it's not track only it's no. not meant to be track only. i don't obviously. think i don't know yeah. there are probably some tracks that won't allow it because unless the roll bar clears or certain with your helmet, um, yeah, I think they, yeah. they, I know the PDK is faster. There's no doubt about it. It's just, uh, for what this seems to be built for, this is almost like the touring version yeah. of the GT4 RS. And that would have been cool to have, uh, and that's six, six speed on. It. And that's the discussion that Peter and I have because his spider is a manual and you know, again, like you, I, I, I realize how amazing the PDK case is, but the romance of driving a manual and the, 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 the blip of the throttle and throttle matching and all that stuff, it's, it's a cool experience. And I kind of wish they did that with this car. There's no romance in throttle and matching. That's all done electronically. Now. I know, but I feel like <laughs> you can pretend you're can like pretend. Uh, yeah. you're your Berg Meister. You're making it actually the accurate. First time, uh, the match. first time I came to it, an off ramp in his car and I went from third, uh, from fourth to third, I'm like, I'm an amazing driver. Cause it's just, it was sounded so perfect. When I used to teach drivers that I would I'd chuckle how many people thought they knew heel and toe. Oh yeah, and I would get done with the session, and I would tell them, "You got to work when you heel and toe." And they go, "No, I know heel and toe." I go, "No, you know heel, <laughs> you and know you know toe. toe. <laughs> you just know how to do them together." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> timing is everything, because you're right. A lot of people think they can heel and toe, and they they go through the motions, but the timing is completely. Oh, especially off. when you're braking so hard on the track, and you've got to make that transition so fast. Um, yeah, I mean, God bless Porsche for for do, do making the automatic blipper, as we used to yeah. call. Wish they would make. Um, because you uh, nail it every single time. But I think, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, will the original Spider retain uh, some of its desirability because it's a stick shift? I think they'll sell every one of these. Uh, oh, yeah. People will complain about the six speed and blah, blah, blah. They'll sell every one of these RS Spiders. But uh, yeah, it's a good argument for those who have the regular Spider that I, I, uh, don't throw it away yet out. That's what I told Peter. Um, I said, Peter, you have, you know, a, a GT2, which. You know, amazing speed and you know track duty if you choose to do so, but I think having one of the last great manual cars is something to be proud of, and you don't need to have the latest Spider. I so mean, this is gonna bug him to no end. Oh, uh, you know it, you know it. It's, I'm probably gonna get a call as soon as this podcast uh, gets released. He's like, well, so should I? So shouldn't I? And you know, it's a first world problem. But um, they're, has, they're all has special. he even seen six gear in his Spider? Because he's so gentle with his cars. He is. The question is, has he seen six miles in the last six months? <laughs> Peter's going to kill me for saying that. But, hey, he, he enjoys his cars, and it's his thing. And, um, you know, every car has a unique personality. Like you said, all every single one of these cars are going to sell. The question is, you know, what's the ADM going to be on something like this? It's going to probably be crazy. People are probably already, like, clamoring to the dealers and trying to get on the list and whatever. Uh, a friend of mine called me up, and he's uh... – he, him and another friend are buying uh, a GT3 RS, a new one. Are they Plan Zing it? They're uh, Plan Zing it, and they're um, it's the 25th anniversary tribute. Oh, yeah. And uh, he said, uh, he goes, I, he goes, I thought the MSRP is like 312, but uh, I uh, the invoice is like 338. Yeah, there's no markup on the invoice. Yeah, he goes, uh, and I don't know what's what's on there that's original, uh, what's part of the package, what isn't. Yeah, so I said, "Well, send me a copy of the invoice." 
Uh, I sent it to Michael Tam. I'm still waiting to hear back. Yeah. Because I tried to break it down because they include, you know, they got the base price of the GT3 RS. And they don't really, they don't have a line that says RS tribute package mm. this much. It's kind of like broken down. So I was going through the press material trying to see what was standard. And I couldn't come, I couldn't get the numbers to match up to see uh. what. Cause it sounds like the, cause the dealer could, didn't know either. And it sounds like either the dealer got the car in some kind of trade, oh. or uh, or you know the build had already been made, and they were picking this car up because I guess an opportunity came. Wow. So so, so speaking of price, the um, the Spider RS, I know this is starting at, but one hundred sixty thousand start price, MSRP for it. This sounds crazy to me to say this, or feels crazy to say this, but. That seems like it's a great deal. I can't. Well, it is a great deal base price. Great deal base price, right? Yeah, like forget the whole ADM and if you had option, but like if talking about what this car has and if it's available at starting at one sixty, I think that's a pretty darn good deal. So who is not going to get the Wysock package? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, right. That's yeah. everyone gets the Wysock package. Yeah, um, and then you got to add on your own special touches to make it the uh, individual. It's um, all of these cars are going to be easily two twenty five to two. Yeah, I guess the question is, how many are they going to make before they stop making them? Um, I don't think they listed a, a limited amount. No, no, but they but there is a deadline, right? Because yeah. they got to do some conversions to the future cars. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, no. it's uh, speaking it's of future, be the key. Um, I'm I'm confident, and I can probably say this that there's more to come. Oh yeah. There's more to come. This is just the beginning. <laughs> well, since I didn't sign a uh, NDA, you did sign an NDA. When did I sign? When an you NDA? were president. Oh, that's that expires after I'm president. <laughs> Don't be getting us in Plus, trouble. Plus, all the models when I was president have come out already. <laughs> Don't get us in trouble. We still have the Sport um, ST mm-hmm. coming out. Um, the, you're you're. You're just surmising now. You're not saying this as well, I don't factual. Know. I honestly don't know. I mean, well, we know. I mean, hope, <laughs> it's got to be the worst kept secret to ST. It's just a matter of when uh-huh. and uh, you know when, when it will appear. I'm still very curious to see what they're going to have at Rensport. Mm. So, like I said, they did a great job of hiding the 935. Yeah. So uh, when they want to hide something, they can hide it. They definitely can. I, when they built the, our classic Club Coupe, there was no photo. You would have nope. thought somebody would say, what's a... Bubble Roof 996 doing, running around uh, mm-hmm. Stuttgart, and uh, they managed to keep it very secret. So uh, this will be interesting to see uh, what they what they come out with at yeah. Ren Sport. We won't we won't be disappointed. Um, what else was I going to ask you? I just I just drew a blank. Anyways, um, great weather you guys had here. I wasn't in town. Uh, beautiful weather, better yeah. than we're gonna have this weekend. That's for sure. Oh, really? Not supposed to rain this Saturday. Ooh, I missed. I know I missed uh, an autocross. Did you? Did you head down? Yeah, to so that? I did uh, three PCA things, or I guess three Porsche things, in two days. Uh, went to Hunt Valley Cars and Coffee. Shout out to Will. Um, of course, tremendous turnout because the weather was so. Uh, That's easily so five hundred nice. plus cars. Yeah, Lee had some friends, and I know I'm going to butcher. It was an S. It was either Sweden or Switzerland. Mm. I can't remember which uh, which country they were from, uh, but he was brought them to the Cars and Coffee, and they were pretty impressed, I think, with all the different. Uh, they were impressed with how many rare European cars there were there. Um, uh, for those of you who've never been to Hunt Valley uh, Cars and Coffee, it's a very chill Cars and Coffee. Uh, one guy named Will runs it. Uh, and uh, keeps the peace if you and he uh has been doing i guess for over 10 years um and you just get a wide range of cars everything, everything from military muscle, vehicles military vehicles muscle cars yeah. jdm you know and exotic cars and everyone's like i said very chill you always have your uh your jerks and usually they're uh banned from the mall or from mm-hmm. the uh, property from coming back but uh i would say 99 percent behave themselves and uh yeah, it was some um, some pretty cool cars. I sent Robert some photos of uh, of um, that's Rich's nine forty four he bought that has it needs an airbox. It looks like somebody punched the airbox. Oh, we couldn't figure out uh, what had happened, but uh, the car uh, is is that Rich it, from At Speed? No, no, another Rich. Oh. Um, he's building the, he's building the nine forty four GTR replica, oh. nine twenty four GTR uh, replica. Um, but this one. Uh, 
it was in pretty good shape. It was almost like a barn find. Uh, the this interior was immaculate except for the seat bottoms. That's weird. They were all cracked, and he, he could only surmise that uh, it sat out in the sun, and the sun, and he never conditioned the leather. Oh, and it dried. So the um, the center was leather, and, and the outside's vinyl. Mm-hmm. So it yeah, dried up and cracked. Uh, but the rest of the interior was just uh, really top shape. So from there, I went to the Chesapeake Autocross, uh, not to participate, just to hang out and watch. Uh, Damon was running. Is that Ripken? Uh, or Ripken or... Stadium, yep. Okay, not too far yeah. from your house. Damon's car right there, the, uh, the Cayman. Silver Cayman. Uh, he finished ninth. Nice. Which he seemed very happy about. Um, they, I think they were sold out. They must have had uh, 70 cars, maybe. Um, That's a good lot, good size lot. Nice yeah, a lot, lot of Porsches, uh, obviously, since it's run by PCA. Uh, beautiful, beautiful day. It looked like a lot of people are having a, a good time. It was uh, in a very long course. I think Damon said it was over a minute, maybe. Oh, nice. The course, yeah. So it was. Uh, and that, that that lot actually has some dips and elevation in it. That depending on where they put the line, you have to be careful correct. that you don't just full throttle across a, a berm. <laughs> yeah, off, there's a lot of turns, and depending on the course, can become off camber because yeah. of the way they do the lot for drainage. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, some. Uh, it can be challenging at times, but it's a smooth lot, and mm-hmm. it's right off Interstate 95, so it's an easy lot for people from Pennsylvania, and Maryland, Delaware to get to. And, it, and I think they did another one on Sunday. It wasn't uh, the PCA; it was another uh, autocross club. Mm. So yeah, it's a pretty popular one. So then I went to uh, on Sunday. I went to the Potomac Region Concours, which was held on the top of a parking garage. No, I think it was just a two-level parking garage. I okay. expected like 10 levels, and uh, it was um, the same day as the Deutsche Mark, but for some reason they weren't part of the Deutsche Mark this year. Oh, that's The Deutsche Mark was just Mercedes and BMW, uh, but they had a where, great where turnout. Was this this was, was in um, Tyson's Corner. Okay. In like so. a business park area. Okay. Um, so it was very quiet. It's very secluded. Uh, if you didn't know, If you didn't see the Potomac welcome sign, uh, you wouldn't know there was a Concord. In fact, when I first pulled into that street and I was going through the skyscrapers, I saw a line of Porsches. So, of course, I pull up mm. and uh, I'm sitting there, shut my engine off, and a guy comes up and he says, we think this is where it's at. We're just waiting for confirmation. Then I looked around and I saw that uh, there was no parking garage. Oh. And uh, I looked at my GPS and it, and it said still to go one block down. So I got out of line, drove a block down, and sure enough, there was the sign. So I had to go around and tell the guys, I don't know why you're waiting here, but it's actually one block down. You can't miss it. <laughs> that's like when you see people in line, you just get in line. Exactly. That's what I did. It, it must be good. We just <laughs> need to stay in line and figure out what it is. Didn't ask uh, any questions. Um, they actually sold out of this one. So I got the display. I was going to bring my 914, but they sold out. So I brought the uh, 964. It was pretty cool, this picture. I got the coupe, there's a cabriolet, and there's a Targa. So it was all three body styles for that 1990 year. That, and they were all in Grand Prix white. Nice. So, yeah, that was a... How uh, many cars were there? I think they said 90 cars. Oh, wow. 60 judged. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a... a good uh, size. It was a good turnout. And I got to admit, I do kind of like it doing it on uh, asphalt or cement. Uh, as opposed be, to grass? As opposed to grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No uh, grass to take off the... Uh, the tires and, and it was a, a very relaxed uh, atmosphere you know people just hanging out and i think i left there by uh two o'clock i wanted to make it home to watch the f1 race in miami um but got to see a lot of people so was that a like a business parking garage that's why it wasn't um occupied for a saturday yes okay yeah. so yeah, it wasn't like, area was so it wasn't like, like a mall parking lot where no, no, okay. there was yeah. no public nothing no public nice in fact uh, somebody uh I saw somebody uh, who must have worked in the office building he said, I just came in today to do some work, and I came across the car office show. window, and I saw these cars. I had to come down to see what was going on. Nice, nice. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Uh, someone had called, and I know we got this answer from Prescott um, on Tech Tactics Live, but someone had uh, asked about 911 ST and where ST came from. Do you remember what, what his reply was? Yes, so they were trying to build a uh, a very light car. So what they would do is they would take uh, the T body, which is actually lighter than the S body, mm. but put 911S running gear when they ordered the car. 
So it was a combination of those two cars why it became ST. ST it was, doesn't is actually it, not the letters ST together. It would be S backslash T. That's uh, not exactly how they were um, uh, They were marketed. But Porsche never sold an uh, ST. They never recognized the name ST. Internally, it became known as the ST. Um, do you, when you, if you spec that, then people, knew, I guess, uh, the factory knew or the people ordering for you knew what you wanted. And um, a lot of people put front flares on them. So okay. it's pretty cool that you know, Porsche ends up calling it an ST. Because uh, finally, officially recognizing it. Uh, the, at uh, was it last year? We were asking uh, the guys from Porsche what ST meant. No one knew <laughs> exactly what yeah. it meant, and I, I didn't know either. But Prescott and uh, uh, Jay Gelati actually um, emailed me after the uh, Prescott saying, "Yeah, there was yeah. actually an article in Panorama, I think, last year, oh, or the year before, uh, describing uh, about the history." Very cool. And then finally, uh, you know, we've been trying to get the uh, the uh, ride height and uh, alignment set up for Project 964. So you went down to Since, visit Mike. Uh, evidently, we're very close to getting a license plate. I guess this yes. thing really has to drive now, not just ride up on <laughs> not, the trailer. Not just a showpiece. And back again. Um, yeah, the good folks at TPC Racing, Tom Chan and Mike Levitas, uh, squeezed us in on a Monday. And so Damon met me there, and we... Um, we took Project 964 to get aligned. You can see a lot of the sponsorship stickers are off right now because the next stop uh, on actually for me tomorrow is taking it up to get it uh, paint corrected and ceramic coated. Nice. Uh, but uh, they adjusted the ride height because I explained to them that I did it manually in our garage just for um, the show field that had nothing scientific. Yeah, it just right. I had to make sure everything was even when I did the ride height. So evidently, I made it too low. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the uh, so I saw he had some sort of level gauge uh, for the rake of the car. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And Mike, so Mike, we kept on coming. Um, our technician uh, would make some adjustments. Go get Mike. And Mike would come back. They put 150 pounds weight in the car. That's what those. That's uh, what you told him your weight was. <laughs> no, I asked him afterwards, and he said 150. I go, wow, I got a lot of <laughs> weight to lose before I get to that uh, point to match the uh, the lead weight you put in there. But that's um, how you know a true alignment shop that they're taking that into consideration. Because I would say 99% of alignment shops out there don't add weight when they're doing an alignment. And 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 he asked us, he said, "What what are you guys going to do with the car?" And I told him, "It's really going to be a street car. We yeah. may do some autocrossing, but it's uh, it's not a track alignment. You yeah. know, we aren't looking. We're not going to be running Hoosier tires. No. We're looking for a certain uh, camber. It's um, tr a street alignment. So." With that knowledge, they set it up for uh, a comfortable street ride. It was rubbing, after we put the suspension on, it was rubbing uh, on the right-hand side really bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was really very worried that they wouldn't be able to stop the rubbing. I thought, man, I don't know if we got the wrong size wheels or mm. maybe these, uh, I don't know, maybe these, I had it on my race car, but the race car had a really stiff suspension. And uh, it was a different setup than this car. So, um but Fortunately, once, once, once I drove it around yeah. the uh, business park and no rubbing at all. And how's it so, ride? Uh, well, it's a little bit. Of oh, because you, yeah, you yeah, didn't really I didn't drive. drive. I was more interested time. in the rubbing because yeah. you could hear the rubbing every time you turned yeah. the wheel. So no more rubbing. No more rubbing. Awesome. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, it was almost an all-day thing. We got there at nine o'clock and we loaded back up around three thirty. And you guys uh, filmed it, so we we're going to share it yep, later. Yep, uh, I did a lot of B-roll, um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a, uh, I guess the part two of the um, the uh, suspension installation. Oh, so now we can complete that video. Yeah, so okay, cool. it's because once you put a suspension in, this, that's only part of it. And the other part, of course, is the ride height and then the, uh, it was interesting how much lower I thought it, and I was telling Mike, I'm like, you know, my race car was even lower than this. Yeah. I thought I was compromising. And because of the springs are not set up, not track springs, mm -hmm. Uh, he was explaining that it was too low and that uh, they had to raise it up. But it still has a great stance on it. Oh, it, it looks, just, looks uh, fantastic. Um, not, uh, I guess, from my eyes from when I had the race car, I just remember the rear fender was like at the middle of the sidewall. Mm -hmm. and, and the car was awesome. Um, so this was a little bit less aggressive, and uh, which is fine. Yeah, we can for get the over street curbs. We almost, almost was able to clear the U-Haul. Oh, really? Where you didn't yeah, have to back uh, up? We put a piece of wood, but I didn't have a warm and fuzzy feeling the way it yeah. was mounted, so we just had to drive like five minutes back to the office. Yeah. 
Uh, but hopefully, once we get the little tags, I want the rent uh, trailer dead off. Yep, that's coming. So, yeah, so MVA, we, we are all set to go with uh, insurance and went down to, we have, in Maryland, we have some of these places where instead of going to the MVA, you can go to this place and they can handle the titles and tags for you. But the MVA had some sort of flag on our thing. And sh- sure enough, when we called the Department of Labor or whatever that flag was, they're like, no, you're in good standing. Then why do we have a flag? Oh, we don't know. <laughs> how, how can we get this removed? Well, we can make a request to the MVA and hopefully they'll take it off for you. I'm that like, brought back <laughs> memories of how I got arrested. <laughs> It's showing on our computer that you paid the fine. I don't know why they would arrest you. But in the meantime, please lay up against the car while we cuff you. Well, you still got to go to court. I know it's a mistake. but Yeah. So anyway, so for those of you that might have been following me on Facebook or heard last week, I completed a pretty amazing road trip with my daughter. Uh, came home in her 220,000 mile, now 222,000 mile uh, 2008 Acura MDX Salt Lake City through nine states, 2,000 miles. But, but you put on there, our Acura MDX got us home with no problem. No, I said got us home safe. I didn't say no problem. <laughs> you have to read okay. it carefully. I said... All right, Apollo 13 <laughs> Commander. <laughs> All right, so, so this car was purchased. Again, if you've been following the podcast for a while, you know that my daughter's perfect Chevy Cruze. I know was, he, he doesn't want to call it this, but it is a Nathan Murr's car. <laughs> it, it, it is, but it, it's not his normal stock. Um, so in, in October, unfortunately, my daughter's perfect Chevrolet Cruze was totaled by somebody T-boning her car. And, you know, we just needed to get a car that she could use for, you know, one more year and just live in Salt Lake City. And Nathan had you know, a family car that his kids were using and it, you know, full disclosure, it wasn't a perfect car, but a car that could live in the city and get beat up, not a problem. Plus she has a dog that weighs more than she does. She has an 82 pound dog and we're like, perfect. So Thanksgiving, she flew and met uh, the car uh, at the airport uh, near Nathan's and drove it, no problem. So it's been fine. It's been fine in the city, but then, um, I'm happy to say that my, my daughter found an internship in Maryland. Uh, great. And, uh, but the, bo- the dog needs to come home too. And then with an 82 pound dog, you can't just put them on the airplane, or at least she tells me you can't. And so that means we need to I think dr- you're putting an 82 pound piece of luggage <laughs> in the airplane. <laughs> um, so that means we have to drive the car home. Now her, her, her boyfriend actually was finishing up school so he drove with the dog um a day ahead of us but she needs to get back to salt lake city in uh, in august with the dog so that's why we we had to drive the mdx home and then in august we'll drive it back to um to salt lake city now again remember i said this car really was only supposed to be like downtown run around throw it around and you know whatever right but now all of a sudden this is car has to be capable of going 2000 miles or 4000 miles total. It's a 220,000 mile Acura MDX. So I had a local mechanic in Salt Lake City run through it all. We, you know, just being a, being a mindful dad, you know, I was like, you know, I'll put in a new timing belt cause I'm not sure when that was done. Uh, so when you do timing belt, you do water pump. And then it had a check engine light because the catalytic converters were 200,000 miles. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put a catalytic converters on it. I'm going to put brand new Pirellis on it, which I'm glad I did because we drove through some serious rain on the second day. But the car was up to snuff and we're like, okay, now I think it's pretty good. It's You've changed most everything, right? Most everything. So day one, nine hours, and we get to uh, North Plot, Nebraska. And at this point, point cars and it's probably my fault because i'm thinking man this car is amazing smooth comfortable plenty of power tons of room for all the stuff she had and the last two hours of that day i was like i'll let her drive and we take the exit for north plot and i could see her as she's like it's a it's like a roundabout exit and i know she's kind of struggling i'm like she's like dad this is weird i'm like what's weird she's like i don't know it's just weird i'm like okay so then we pull into the hotel parking lot which is not even a mile from the exit ramp and now she's fighting the steering wheel i'm like oh i was like i do remember hearing a little squeak 
when I was in Utah thinking, oh, I'll probably have to put a power steering pump on this thing when we get home. The power, so she, she barely is able to navigate it into a parking space in the hotel. So she goes, dad, what's wrong? I'm like, I know exactly what's wrong with it. But I'm thinking to myself, well, if the power steering pump just doesn't work, we could probably just still drive it. I just have to, you know, just, you know, when it's slow, just kind of steer harder, right? Like it should be okay. That was my initial thought. And then I opened the hood and uh, Robert has some photos here. I looked at the pulley on the uh, power steering pump and I noticed there wasn't a nut holding the pulley onto the power steering pump. Is this pump. part of the serpentine belt or does it have? Yes. Oh, okay. So so now this only has one serpentine belt. Like if it had its individual, That's what I, mean. I would have just cut it and yeah. we would have driven sure. home without power steering. So now I'm looking at this pulley that is wobbly. I'm like, oh man, this this is not good. Like this will, and I'm, you know, the, the whole time I was thinking how thankful I was that we got to the hotel before we found out this was an issue because we had just drove nine hours and who knows when this nut fell off and she's like how come we didn't hear it for the past nine hours like and i don't have an explanation but maybe the car gods was just looking after us so we, age <laughs> yeah. so so anyways so i'm not panicking because we're safe and everything but i'm trying to figure out the game plan and this is probably where it's really important where you know, if you're traveling long distances and either your kid or your loved one that doesn't know cars, this is where sometimes it really does help to know what you should and shouldn't do, you know, once things go wrong. So anyways, so I see that this pulley is now wobbly. I'm like, we definitely can't drive down the road. And it's like seven o'clock. And so I'm like, you know what? The first thing is I need to source a power steering pump. And the good news is on an Acura, it's just like every Accord, every Odyssey is the same freaking uh, power steering pump. So I called AutoZone. They had one in North Platte, uh, Nebraska. And when I went there, I was I also thought that maybe I could just buy a nut and tighten the one that was already on there. But of course, here's for those of you that have an Acura or Honda, you need to find a M14. So it's a metric nut with a 1.25 pitch and just throw one of those into your glove box because you would think buying a power steering pump, it would have it. It doesn't have that nut. You would think buying the pulley for that water pump, it would have that nut. Nope, it doesn't have that. And you would think going to the hardware store, you could find an M14 1.25 nut. No, you can find M14 2.0, you can find M14 1.75, you can find M14 1.5, but not 1.25. So that's we, surprising because you would think North Platte, I think Chicago, <laughs> San Francisco, North Platte. North Platte, exactly. <laughs> so so the good news is 7:30 in the morning, we found the shop. So shout out to Eric at Loman's Auto Center. Uh, and Brandon at uh, the auto center there, they literally, uh, I, I've also Was said- Was that an engine case, like an oil change <laughs> that came in the day yeah. before? So so I'm sending Manny these photos of this place and they do everything there, right? And um, so they, they I, let me back up a little bit. So a few podcasts ago, I think I told you guys how frustrated I was with AAA. I can tell you AAA and North Plot, Nebraska, they freaking rock, like they were there almost instantly and i use them twice because when what's I, the population in north platte 20 i don't <laughs> i don't know but every single person in north platte are super nice super amazing super helpful um so anyways uh so i was at after after i bought all the parts i went to a hardware store to try to find that nut Twenty three thousand people yeah okay so you know not tiny um so i went to the hardware store to find that nut and I couldn't and when I went out to the car the belt was already halfway off the pulley so I'm like there's no way even though the hotel is like two miles away there's no way I'm getting back to the hotel so AAA came and towed the car back to the hotel and then I knew I was going to need to tow to whatever place I decided to get it fixed uh, shout out to Jordan at the hardware store he and Koi waited with us until the AAA truck came they just hung out 
and just you know we talked cars and he was uh had they ever seen an asian person before <laughs> <laughs> they were super nice super nice so i've got i've got four i new, did look up to i've got see four new friends in, in you, north where, Platinum, you Nebraska. Say where you were i did look up to see if there's any vietnamese restaurants no because i'm like i'll be damned if he finds a no you know i they I, had an oriental restaurant they did they did okay i mean i honestly i wasn't stressed like I wasn't stressed. Like, oh, you nervous. break down in a hotel yeah, parking that's, lot. That that's is like, like the, the best, perfect, the obviously. ideal. You right? can't nail it. And people there that. were so nice. Um, and then the next morning at 7.30, I called. Eric picks up the, the call. He's like, yeah, just get it towed in. He literally was waiting at the bay when the tow truck came, pushed, you know, dropped it right in, and they started working on it right away. So now we have the part. Well, we have two of the three parts. We have the pump and we have the pulley. And you would think... All the stuff that they've worked on, they would have. They would all. He was pretty sure that he would be able to find one. And this is the the amazing people and service of North Platte, Nebraska. Not a one. That whole that whole place. All the stuff you saw in front of his shop, there was no M14, uh, 1.25 nut. So you know what they did. This is gonna. What do you? How would you have solved the problem? Oh, Acura, like two hours away. Honda didn't even have the didn't you even have the water part. Reuse the old one. It fell off. That's why the whole pulley oh, was. It, it fell right off. Now. It fell off. So how would you have figured it out? I guess. And, and you don't want to jam a. Well, the pitch bad, is the I was the say. pitch. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to jam a bad nut on it. What they do? They called to a salvage yard, oh, and they wow. went. They picked. They picked a nut from a salvage car, and came back, and it was the right one, obviously. Tighten it all up, put power steering fluid on it. If it wasn't for the nut, they would have been done probably in, and I've done this job. I've done this job on my Odyssey. They probably would have been maybe half an hour. So I think it took them an hour wow. because they had to go to the to the, to the salvage yard and, and find the nut, threw it on together, and then guess how much they charged me? <laughs> they didn't ask you how much you got? <laughs> no, 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 not the video. A very reasonable $120. Wow. Yeah. I'm guessing the cost and, of living is not as high as Columbia, I was Maryland. So happy with them, and I even, you know, I was like, "Let me buy you guys lunch." And so, very amazing experience. So, if you have to break down, if you're going across I-80, North Platte, Nebraska, um, Eric at Lomans Auto Service, and just the people of North Platte, they are freaking amazing. That was very cool, very cool. Uh, because ten miles before and after North Platte, there is nothing but fields oh yeah and the whole time i was just thinking how thankful i was that it was in the parking lot of the hotel that all this happened when i drove cross country to sacramento as when i i tell people i go you have no idea how big our country is until you drive cross country oh my gosh yeah because we're here in the east coast we're used to uh uh you know uh humanity being every exit mm -hmm. there being a wendy's there being a lowe's or being everything every yeah. exit i said once you went i got past chicago yes um, you were looking to see when's the next gas stop because it, there's no given that the next exit would have a gas stop. And I said, uh, we have so much land in our country. Oh, yeah. It's no wonder the Europeans, you know, well, you hear them say sometimes, uh, yeah, I'm going, I, I, I want to go see Texas, Miami, <laughs> all these sites in a week. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a little bit of space in between those spots. And it, is, it was a great experience. My daughter, uh, so she drove those two hours. But I really wasn't, you know, just to be safe, I just drove the rest rest of the way. And I got to give my daughter credit. I think total driving time was about 28, 30 hours. You know how much she spoke <laughs> during the 28 to 30 hours? Pretty much all of it. <laughs> she did not take a nap. We talked about everything. It was a wonderful experience. And like you said, going through areas for hours where it was just open fields and cows and I made it a point where, you know, we would leave as soon as the sun would come up, but we were like, our goal was to park the car as soon as it was dark, because if something happens sure. in the middle of the night, in the middle of a field, I'm sure it would be fine, but I just didn't want us to hey, be make in the situation. time because I thought after this repair job, I thought there's no way no, of we, here. it only put us like two hours behind my original plan. And we actually made up for it the next day because we woke up super early. And so we pulled into the house around 6.30 yesterday. So three days, that was the goal. And um, awesome trip. Uh, now I'm really, you know, what I didn't get to do, obviously because the car was in the, uh, 
in Salt Lake City. He's like, I've never been able to go through the whole car. So I want to go through it over the next two months, detail it, put brakes on it, just look at, you know, if there's any Will you leaks. leave the sound system alone? Uh, no, we definitely have to put in. So the subwoofer <laughs> in her cruise, and, and that's the only thing that we were probably complaining about is the subwoofer that is stock in the MDX is, you know, mediocre at best. And so we're going to definitely put a... So take that amplifier and subwoofer from her cruise and put it in there. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, that was our whirlwind trip and uh, amazing experience. It's kind of cool to think that back in the day, people did that without a cell phone, without oh, yeah. GPS. When I did the cross country, you were just reading. Like you, you said you used to tow when to parade the, across the country. Well, you yeah, didn't have anything. I was going to say I just used Rand McNally. Yeah, and you maybe had a CB radio. I to remember maybe call it for help. Filling up with gas in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and as the as a, I was a suburban when it, I think I had like a forty some gallon tank on the suburban, so I'm sitting there for a while waiting, and I'm looking at the map, and that's when I realized the next exit was like a hundred <laughs> miles away, and uh, back but you're looking at Rand McNally, so it doesn't have gas. Yeah, and I thought long and hard, and I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to stay here in Cheyenne. Yeah, and uh, I'll just start up really early in the morning. And by the time, uh, my fear was that I would there would be a gas station, but they would be closed at 10 o'clock at oh, night. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there was no GPS. There was nothing. And there was no cell phone signals. It was just. Yeah, and I, I remember, like, trips as a kid, you know, we'd pile into the station wagon, go from Maryland to, you know, Montreal. My dad would just have a map, and he'd mm -hmm. have the, it highlighted. And I don't know, was he nervous or not? Like, because you don't, I don't know, you didn't know any better. But, so. well, you know, uh, I. You would, you would, um, you knew that if you broke down in the interstate, eventually a, a police officer would stop. Yeah, and they would call a tow truck for yeah. you. Um, so you just, uh, yeah, you yeah. hope it, for the best. So, so you'd be proud of me because you know how uh, frugal I can be, and because I know how to fix things, like I, it took it took a quite a bit for me not to try to just fix the power steering pump myself that night. Uh, <laughs> Because I've done it before, and I know I just need socket sets, and I just need one pry bar to loosen the belt. But I said, you know what? Secure the part. Still take it to a shop. Because should something happen while you're doing that job, you'll have other tools. You'll have other people to, um, you know, just and 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 and, and just let it get get done. Pay for it. Let somebody do it. And that was that was the more mature view. <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> And we were doing the, well, not we, but when we were watching the alignment being yeah. done on the 964, um, the tech was saying, oh, it's really nice adjusting the height on a brand new suspension. You yeah. know, it's, so everything moves. But then we got to the alignment, and now we're talking 30 some year old uh, parts. Yeah. And uh, oh my God, that was, that's why it took so long because at one point he had to bring the torch out because he couldn't get a nut. Oh, uh, yeah. He had to get help. Uh, it was on the tie rod, I think. They just couldn't uh, get it uh, um, loose. And I, I was, I, at one point, I joked and I said, Yeah, do, your, do the alignment at home. It's so easy. You can do it yourself. No problem. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Yeah. 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 Uh, they were having trouble here. This is a fully uh, manned and yeah. equipped shop. And that's that's what I didn't want to get. Like, you know, I didn't want to be in the parking lot cursing because of one nut or because of. Oh, no, you're talking so, a yeah. car that has yeah. over 200,000 miles. So, yeah. You know, it's. Um, Oh, one other thing I didn't mention to you. So this is how good they were. They were looking at uh, the power steering fluid and wanting to make sure they put proper power steering fluid in the car. And I don't think it matters that much for uh, an Acura MDX. It's pretty common. But they didn't have, they worked primarily, if you can imagine, on domestic vehicles. So they needed or they wanted to get the right power steering fluid for the car. They said that. And then literally two minutes later, a guy pulls up in a car. Here's your power steering fluid that you need. <laughs> I don't even know how it happened. <laughs> like the connections of the small town is amazing. Like the dude just walks in and just had the right power steering fluid. Oh, wow. And, yeah. So very cool. Um, yeah. So wish us luck when we head back. So next time I'll take a little bit longer because next time we'll have the dog. And apparently when you stop with the dog, you got to take it for like a 30 minute walk to tire it out every time. So <laughs> it's good. It would Chevy Chase to just tie it to the back bumper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. So some videos that came out, uh, the 924 manual versus the 924 auto that was done here locally. 
uh, Damon took a ride in uh, some local members' cars, and we haven't done that model before, I don't think. It's interesting because it's not doing that well in views. It's a very uh, specific uh, It just makes me wonder, you know, uh, um, obviously uh, our club is made up of uh, – all the Porsches that have ever been made, mm -hmm. and uh, not everything's a GT4 or GT3. Because the reality is, people have uh, owned m older uh, cars, uh, so uh, the people who love these cars love the fact that we do cover them. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, it was there because how many how many channels are covering 924 automatics? Right, right. And that's the thing is, people sometimes criticize us that we only have you know footage on newer cars or maybe two-door cars we do really try to cover the range of porsches but we have to be smart about it like we have to make sure you know when we do cover it understand that we throw it into the mix to balance things out because we can't do a 10-part series on a 924 it's just the channel will, would suffer for yeah. it because there's just not a large audience for it. it's not that we don't like them it's just that we have to adjust what we're doing that we're gonna get more views right so Let's see. Um, last week, comments on the podcast. What kind of stuff? Ian's always throwing some funny stuff out there. Um, anything in particular that jumps out at you from last week's podcast? No, I think it was pretty positive. Not a whole, a whole lot of comments. but uh... So let's go. Um, I don't know if I said it earlier, but uh, Robert, if you want to throw up, and we would appreciate if you enjoy the podcast, like, comment, and subscribe. And then also, if you haven't joined uh, and enrolled in eBreak News, Performance News, or Mart Fresh News, you can do so. It's all free at pca.org slash newsletter sign up. So let's get into some Porsche news. We already did talk about the um, the Spider RS, but there's there's more stuff out there. You, um, this one's really interesting. The the paying tribute to the cancer patient. I'm guessing you didn't read any of these links. I did, did actually. Oh, did you? I did. I did. <laughs> no, that's fine because I'll uh, I'll walk you through them. <laughs> so I uh, I saw this on Facebook and I thought this was pretty cool. The Lone Star region of the Porsche Club of America answered a request from a uh, family who whose uh, dad uh, was a Porsche fan. He had two Porsches and he was suffering from terminal cancer. Oh. And he didn't have long to live, and they basically wanted to cheer him up and have the cars, uh, some Porsches drive by his house. They thought that would be pretty cool. And so the Lone Star region stepped up to bat, and they arranged to have the cars. Unfortunately, the father passes away oh, before he gets to see this. Oh. Yeah, so um, the club uh, said, reached out to the family and said, we'd still like to drive by as a tribute to your dad. Nice. And they, they were just tickled that uh, the club would do that. So uh, they parked his cars out front, and they had a chair, empty chair, you know, just saying, hey, Dad would be watching from above. And uh, a whole slew of uh, uh, Lone Star members uh, paraded in front of the house. I thought that That's was a awesome. very nice touch. Uh, showed the car community, the Porsche community, who will come out when the call is made. And uh, it even made the local local news. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love stories like that. That's that's what we're all about. We love the cars, obviously, but you know it is about the people. And you know if it's cheering one of our own up or cheering someone that's just a Porsche fan, that's very cool to do. Uh, the next one news item a I saw was like a military Cayenne. So this group uh, that takes uh, you looks for donations of vehicles that they can send to the Ukraine for the war effort, and somebody donated a Cayenne. And so they outfitted this Cayenne for military use. I can only imagine that the top brass cop commander yeah. maybe uh, got the yeah. car. Um, they painted it in the uh, draft, military, like draft uh, green. Uh, olive drive green, I guess, yeah. and uh, equipped it as best they could. And somewhere right now in the war in Ukraine, there's someone driving a Cayenne. Whoa. I thought that was uh, mm. that was pretty cool. Yeah. The next one is kind of futuristic. It has to do with automated driving, right? So this came out, uh, I think, the same day as the Spider was announced. So it was kind of like quiet. Uh, but Porsche has partnered with Mobileye, who makes the, I think, what is it, Level 4 um, automated driving, which mm -hmm. is full automated driving. Yeah, no, close your eyes and go to sleep driving. Basically, <laughs> it, that's it. Yeah, so um, it's obviously Porsche planning for the future on some of their cars because they know... Fully automated driving is coming. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I think Porsche owners, I would like to think, would be the last to fully embrace it. They still want to have uh, the full driving experience. But, uh, hey, many times when uh, you're leaving work. Um, uh, my recent road trip. I would sign up for yeah, wouldn't you? I mean, when I when I when I was on I eighty, literally my hands were on the steering wheel, but it really didn't need to be. And if there's a system where for the next two hours I could sit back and just have a conversation sure, with I my would, kid and, yeah. and be safe, dude, sign me up. Or you know, even coming home from work and I'm in forty five minutes an hour of traffic, yeah. uh, you're not enjoying the performance driving or anything. No, so no. what better way to let the car uh, do the do the hard work and you can sit back and uh I'm looking forward to that. Check emails or listen and just relax. Uh so yeah, so am I. So uh yeah it was kinda quiet but I didn't see a whole lot of news coverage the fact that Porsche partnered with Mobileye, who has a lot of experience and has gone um pretty far with this uh Technology. Level four uh, automated driving. So, speaking of technology, do you realize Justine used cruise control for the first time in her car because her cruise was a base base model, didn't have cruise. Oh wow! So she was like, "Dad, I never used cruise. Oh, that sounds kind of scary to me." So she, I learned, don't, I don't like to use cruise. I, I mean, when you're just even on long trips, on I, long trips, it's yeah. nice because then you can stretch. Your I don't leg want. Well, or, see, I don't want anything to make me feel comfortable enough where I'm going to start falling asleep. That's where my daughter comes in, and she was talking to me the whole the whole way. <laughs> yeah, but at some point, it becomes just like no. a white noise, and uh, no, we we know. as the kids would to- term it now, we got into some tea. You know, are you familiar no. with that term? You can ask your daughter to share some tea with you. Uh, What's the tea stand for? Uh, that's a good question. All I understand out of the <laughs> tea oh, talk, uh, Robert said talk. <laughs> The t- sharing the tea is sharing all the drama, the stories of what's going on. So, so for those of you that are listening, if you want to impress your your the youngins, just ask them to share the tea with you. <laughs> so, um, my daughter, when she was younger, she uh, I would pick her up from school, and we had a twenty minute ride back to the house, and she would talk about her day. <laughs> I would stop, fill up with gas, get back in the car, and she was just nonstop the <laughs> still lucky. And of course, that's why she's dating a guy who's very quiet yes. because she does all the talking. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, that's uh, that's still, um, I, I, yeah, I, not not against uh, cruise control. I just never use it. I don't use it that much, but on a trip like on this trip, I used it a lot. It was very nice to just be able to stretch and move your legs around. And what I did miss is in Loanne's car, it has adaptive cruise control. That's even cooler because this one is like you kind of had to play with the on and off when you were catching up to things and then you'd have to turn it off and then turn it back on. So first world <laughs> problem. That sounds like a lot of anxiety. <laughs> yes. uh, but for, I mean, I 80 was just like, a, I mean, we were on there forever. So, so you just set it at, you know, 75, 76 and just kept I running. do salute the Germans and maybe uh, the rest of Europe is like this too, but they don't on purpose do not have those long straight stretches that America's mm-hmm. famous mm-hmm. for. And uh, I just read about this somewhere on Reddit where it's called, uh, well, it's known as highway hypnosis, but they had the actual, I guess, formal name. And I'm sure everyone listening, this has happened to where you've gotten home, but have no memory of how driving you the last 10 minutes. Yeah, or something. Your body's yeah. almost like an automated mode. And I can't even tell you how many times driving home from Sebring that I'm like, there's hours I cannot remember driving. I'm, I'm, Oh, Guessing yeah. I didn't hit anything because the suburban. Yeah, you're just in a zone. You're just in yeah, a zone. Just, it's it's uh, one one person wrote in and said that his boss was trying, said that he was talking to him and he was just looking straight ahead, and he was yeah. like in a trance. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, in Germany, they I think they the autobahn was planned where it had turns all over, so it keeps you awake, keeps your mm-hmm. attention better than the long long stretches oh, that yeah. we have here. Makes sense. Uh, next, we have uh, a friend of ours, Volker Holzmeier, uh, talking about a new program. Yeah, so this was a, a video um, where he's talking. They ex- expanded the uh, junior program. It's pretty cool. It's like the minor leagues for Porsche, uh, where they start off with the. Uh, see if I get this right. They start off with the GT4 Club Sport, mm-hmm. and then they move to the GT3, at a, uh, and they have different levels within that. All aiming for the Carrera Cup, and then higher. And so uh, they have shootouts, and they don't do it just in the U.S. They do it all over the, uh, the world. They bring people together. But this is a great way for Porsche to um, identify potential talent and then just keep on mentoring them and training them. They're not considering factory drivers. 
uh, even though they're all wearing Porsche Motorsport shirts. Um, they're just junior drivers, so they're man. How cool that, would that have been? I mean, like you look they, at the video. I'm like, these kids look like they're ten year olds. Oh yeah, like <laughs> you look at them. Like, do they even have their drivers license? That's what I thought when I was yeah. watching the video. I'm like, I'm really old. I, they, these kids look so young, and, and you know they're all on Sims, yeah. practicing on Sims. We had a few of them come to Sports Car Together Fest uh, last year, and uh, yeah, it's it's great. You can see there's uh, several women as well. Uh, but it's, it's and these great. are career commitments for them. Like sure, these, yeah. these, you call it, you say kids, but they are so focused and they're not and, only trained in, yeah. in the driving part, but the whole media part. Absolutely. And so, cause they, you know, nowadays driving a uh, race car as a profession is much more than just driving right. in, the, in the car. It's uh, what you do afterwards. It's right. working with sponsors. It's uh, understanding PR. Yeah. It's, um, it's a career commitment. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. Them. Expanding cool. their, uh, their junior presence and uh, building a nice um, platform. I'm going to say, like for those who watch baseball, it's like a it's like a farm system mm, mm-hmm. of, of uh, drivers. I understood that. I understood that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> the do next you, one I probably do you know our Baltimore Orioles are doing really well because we have a good farming system <laughs> that supplies they, uh, them with so players. We're in the American League East. We're okay. in second place. Uh huh. And um, the Yankees, who don't really know we exist, but everyone in Baltimore hates the Yankees. They do, um, okay. Yeah, and uh, the Yankees are in last place. Mm. Usually they're always on the top. Tampa Rays first place, but I think uh, we might be five games behind. But this is incredible because the Orioles have just, everyone's lost interest because they've been doing so bad. But now, you know, I hear people saying, I might go to a game, and that's great because yeah. I would love to see where the stadium is filled again like it used to be. Back in the '90s, so anyways, oh. uh, so just to keep your prize okay. in conversations. That, that the Orioles are doing are pretty good. Up. Pretty good. So I, I thought of you the other day because um, there's a new series on Netflix called something about collectibles, but golden golden auctions. Yeah. And I thought of you, and I'm going, man, look at and one. It makes me feel good as a hoarder because the stuff I keep. <laughs> but like some of the memorabilia, like what is it that the the, the the card with like the patches from one of the basketball players and they buy these $20,000 cases and hoping that they find it. And when you find it, it's basically like Willy Wonka's. Let's see, to me, that's like the death of a hobby, honestly, because when you didn't collect uh, baseball cards or comic books when you were little thinking you were going to pay for your college idea, education, yeah. Yeah. you bought, you collected them because they were, they, they were Orioles. Yeah. You wanted, you know, when I, I'm growing up in Baltimore, I probably traded away valuable cards because I wanted. We all wanted Orioles mm-hmm. cards, not uh, anyone else. And same thing with comic books. Comic books we actually read, and we would just keep them in the box afterwards. Uh, but now everybody, you can't you can't read them because that would ruin the value. Right. You, same right. thing with the cards. The cards have to stay pristine. And I think once you start monetizing them like that, like the value. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it's like cars, you know, when people there are is, more worried about the value than the, yeah. the, the the love of driving. The enjoyment of it. So there was one, one real quickly, again, I don't fully understand the phenomenon around this. But like I never collected baseball cards and such, but there was this one kid that had a card, always kept it kind of pristine, and they had to get it graded by somebody. And by the naked eye, it's probably like a eight and a half or something like that. But when you send it out to be graded, they look at the foil and if there's like an abrasion mark on the foil, it drops to like an eight. And if it goes from eight and a half to an eight, it's like a hundred thousand dollars difference in value. Like that is insane. And this kid just seemed like it was just, you know, any normal kid and he was smart enough to keep it in a little case. But now he has this sports card and not having to make like some crazy decisions well, he's, he's looking he's looking at six figures in the show and yeah it's um it's crazy uh, to me a hobby cannot sustain itself if it's based on that kind of value yeah. you have people who are not enthusiasts and just buy it all buying it trying to make money off of yeah. it and that's what's happening with hot wheels is um you know i loved collecting toy car porsche toy cars mm. and the the lore of hot wheels and matchbox was at one point they were only a dollar yeah. So you buy one and you could open the package up, put it on display, not a big deal. Now they're so valuable and they're so in demand that people don't open uh, them. Well, no, they're going to the Walmarts and Targets and employees 
Oh. Or either grabbing it themselves or holding it for friends mm-hmm. who then immediately put it on eBay yeah. and share it properly. That ruins it all. Sure it does. Because yeah. the ones that you're like, oh, I hope I can find a special one. You know you're never going to find a special one. So now I don't even go to the toy aisles anymore. Oh, man. Because I know I'll, I'll just wait for this uh, phase to die down. When people, It's like the Beanie Baby phenomenon. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, it suddenly you had people collecting Beanie Babies because they thought their retirement plan would be based there, there's oh, an episode yeah. they, where they cover Beanie Babies. I saw that. Did you watch that one? <laughs> yeah, I watched the whole series. I loved those, uh, anything with doing collecting yeah. and, and whatnot. And, um, but, you know, it's, you know, the question I get when people see my collection is, what's the most valuable? Yeah. And I always tell them, I go, I have no idea. I, I don't buy on value. I yeah. buy by what I like, right. what, I, what I, um, um, appeals to me. Uh, to me, this is not a collection that I put. You didn't put it together of, in hopes that it's going to become... You just enjoy it, right? No, I, I mean, I, I looked up some of the stuff when I was going to take it to the swap meet, and I said, you know what? I'm going to sell cheaper than whatever it sold for on eBay. Mm-hmm. So if anyone asks, I'm going to say, less than it's cheaper than you can get on eBay, plus you don't pay shipping. Yeah. Uh, but, and I was surprised on some of the stuff that, that was what the price was. But, yeah, I don't – I just keep – I just buy it because I like to look at it. That's it. The next news item we have, it's sort of the fashion world kind of crosses Porsche. Have you heard of this person? Uh, I'm, you know, fashionable a, a bit, <laughs> but I don't know Amy Leon Diore. Well, that's a pretty good uh, pronunciation. We'll say that's the correct way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with it. Uh, not the first time. Uh, I think it's a guy. Is it? I don't know. I think it. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, but they've done other cars, other mm-hmm. Porsches. And, and I know you asked me to push the classic do this, and I did a lot of research. I could well, not who find did, who did this car. That's what I want to know. It has to be Porsche. I don't know. if It was Porsche in Germany. You would think Porsche Classic, if they did it here, would have. I, there was nothing on social media on their social media. Yeah, showing the build of this car, or I'll have to ask our buddies uh, uh, at Classic who did that. Yeah, the, the wheels looked a little bit like Rod Emery, but I'm sure Rod would have put something on his yeah. something. I can't find. Couldn't find any trace of. Uh, it's a beautiful 1960, I think. Yeah, 356 he used and put his own touches and uh, they removed the bumpers. It's kind of outlawish. Yeah, but still very classic looking. Yeah, it's, it's very well done. It has white walls. I'm mm. not a big fan of white walls, but on this car it looks good. I think it looks right. Yeah, it's. Mm. Um, he did a 911 SC, I think, prior to this, and maybe mm. another Porsche before that. Um, very but cool. yeah, Porsche had it on the social media, but they didn't have anything about the build. Mm. So. Anyways, uh, you can look it up. Uh, it's evidently a clothing line. I um, I've never probably, heard of it. Probably doesn't come in my size. Won't see me anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sneakers. Yeah, I'm not a sneaker follower. That uh, was in the news for uh, I think that a couple of days before the RS Spider. Because now everything yeah. is about the RS Spider. Yeah. So from the 356, we go all the way to the other end of the lineage, the Boxster EV prototype, which we've seen before. Yeah, more and more testing is going on. Um, I still say it's a heck of a good-looking car. Absolutely. It does not look like an EV car. And I still remember what Chris Harris said when you interviewed him. Um, the telltale um, sign, if you will, for EVs is when somebody finally builds a fun one. Mm-hmm. And this may be it. This may be the one that uh, all the people who are naysayers about electric cars uh, may, may turn them around. I know I'm excited about it. I am. Uh, uh, again, you know, the, you know, re- re- referring back to the road trip, you know, I, I I rattled off all the different things that I've changed on the MDX, but as I was driving, Justine noticed that I was like sniffing the AC. She's like, "Dad, what are you doing?" I was like, "I'm just kind of smelling to see if there's any oil smells or coolant smells that's coming yep. through." Yeah, as many things as I did change, there's still so many potential components in a gas engine that can fail. Like it's going to be nice when you go to an electric engine or electric motor that you don't have so many components that you have to worry I, about. I know they make electric power steering now for gas cars, mm-hmm. uh, but I think still a lot of conventional cars have the old setup. Yeah, like, still, uh, you know, like still so many and pumps and pulleys and. Yeah coil packs all, and all, all these areas where things of, can go yeah, wrong yeah and uh how what you you mentioned it before what's the reduction in number of parts when you go from a oh boy combustion it engine is to like a, 
to a to electric motor. I, I thought it was like thirty percent of the moving parts that a yeah. Uh, it's the total car, not just the engine. oh total car. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Well, we saw it at um, Tech Tactics when they had the the electric motor next to the GT2 RS. Mm -hmm. and it was a um, the electric motor had one plug. <laughs> yeah, that was it. it yeah. was uh, everything else was all uh, within the uh, self contained, but there was no no hoses, no belts. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, Hard to argue. Yeah. There was so much you could see that could go wrong with the GT2 RS. So I'm looking forward to that, but I also will say, going cross country, I would not do it in an electric car right now because, and I didn't see many of them on I-80 as we were traveling because where you will charge next and how long you want to spend your time there, it's still not, it's still not ready for yeah, prime it's, time. And people have to understand that this isn't the way it's always going to be. Yeah, it's going to change so at some least, point. I can't. I say it all the time. I compare it to when records and CDs, you know, there was a time when you couldn't find CDs everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it was just very limited. And the people would say, oh, this is why it's never going to take over. But it does. It does, yeah. And then CDs got taken over because of streaming. Which I also thought. Yeah. How I are you going to stream quality I music? Well, I couldn't understand. Why would somebody pay for something and not something have tangible in their hands? Yeah. Yeah. Looking at the album cover is part of the fun of and. I didn't even think of so that. So then I will take it a step further. Why do we need to own cars? I, well, I don't think that's taken off, though, because Porsche tried that, and I with haven't heard their, much with about With their it. passport program or their drive program? Yeah, I think yeah. people still want to have yeah. ownership. I think, um, I think our generation does, but I don't know that my kids really care about ownership. They care about the experience, absolutely, but do they necessarily want to own it? I don't know that they do. I think the uh, I think that would work with the non enthusiasts. Yeah, I think an enthusiast would want to take I care agree. of his, their car, his or her car. Yeah. Um, but I, I I also wonder if there's any way you could have shared ownership with two people or three people. You know, like do the Plan Z, Plan Z and, yeah. uh, that Spike and Zuckerman do, and that way you can get into a expensive car you mm -hmm. wouldn't get into otherwise, and you share share. I'm sure someone. Well, we yes, saw someone. That idea. We saw someone. I think it was at. Was that at Amelia? They had like a program where you could buy mm -hmm. a percentage of the car and then a you vintage car. Yeah, yeah, of a vintage car, you can share ownership so many months of the year, and you kind of sign up. They do it by like twelve months or something, something like that. that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. We uh, you mentioned Tech Tactics a little bit earlier. So Tech Tactics Live coming up on May seventeenth. We will be talking confessions of a car insurance salesman. So Lee Rock, uh, who's been in the club for a long, long time in the Chesapeake region, um, up until uh, I think last year he was their insurance um, chair, and he is a uh, long time uh, insurance salesman. Mm -hmm. And he loved the idea of coming on and basically answering in all the questions uh, people have about insurance. And I told him, I said, you know, there's so much misinformation out there. And a lot of it's just hearsay people get yeah. about uh, what, what to look for when you're just buying regular insurance as well as collector card insurance. Um, but a lot depends on having a good uh, agent because a lot of people base their insurance on the best rate. Right. And they find out when they make a claim that having the best rate doesn't mean you have the best experience. Yeah, you can get you can get some headaches. And I know of my I, I've said things I've said it before. My son, when he had work done to his uh, VW Atlas, um, there was a lot of arguing and fighting going on because the insurance company wanted to uh, lowball him and not fix it the right way. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily, he took it to a shop that fought for him and explained to the insurance company that they had to pay extra to get it done the right way. Um, versus my experience where. With my collector car insurance, they just fixed it. Lena West did, uh, wanted all factory parts, wanted everything done correctly. It was a great experience. So, anyways, uh, Lee Rock will be on. If you can watch it live, I think it's going to be a very popular show. I told Lee, I said, I anticipate a lot of questions. Yeah. Because. Uh, and I'll be bringing to the table a lot of a lot of knowledge in the sense where I had to go through. I just mentioned that my, my daughter's car was T-boned in, in November and, and Manny, you too, you went through where someone hit your car and how to react at the scene of an accident and how to kind of get started through the claim. You never admit anything. You need to have a plan or at least know how to approach it because if you don't, it really could lead you down the wrong path and then and, and course correcting later is much harder to do. My mother-in-law got her um, newest um, 
premium and it went up and she can't figure out why because she's not working anymore mm -hmm. and uh so my wife is saying what do you think can, can cause it i said well actually we're gonna have a show on this so it's mm -hmm. a good question because there's so many factors i'm sure but you know because she has had two accidents but none of her her fault yeah so does the insurance company still look on favor because they know she's had two accidents even though they weren't her fault right does that affect you? I, I think Lee will uh, hopefully dispel a lot of. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to be one of those shows that uh, people will want a part two. Yeah. Because how many times would you love to have an insurance person you can just uh, pick their brain on different things that. Uh, well, one of my questions is, and hopefully Lee can answer it, like take our 2008 Odyssey that now has, you know, 200 some thousand miles. Like when we first bought that Odyssey, the price was X for insurance. We've owned it since 2008. The insurance is still the same price like the value of the car is next to nothing now but why is the insurance premium for that car well, i know when still i had my business uh if you don't if you don't um price the insurance out almost every year they just leave they, it basically they're hoping i'm sure it's a percentage they hope that yeah. they don't uh um, people huh. don't price it out and just stick yeah. with it um like well i mean our car a lot of several of our cars we just have liability mm -hmm. But even with just liability, um, like when Leah and I were talking now on Monday. That's where something uh, happens, you just walk away from that car. Yeah, but yeah. it's also, if it's your fault, um, how much coverage will you have? Like he said, he goes, there's guys out there who have self, uh, you know, net worth over several million dollars, yet they have the most minimal mm -hmm. uh, co coverage. Mm -hmm. And if something happens, uh, they don't sue for what your insurance limit is. They sue for what they think they want to get. And right. if they see that you have a net worth of several million dollars, they're going after that, which yeah. means your insurance will reach, reach its limit, and then they're going to go after what you personally Your own. personal, yeah. So uh, you want to make sure that all these are, uh, limits are covered. And, uh, and, and I said, I, I still can't. It amazes me how many people with vintage cars I happen to mention. I asked him, I said, so I said, you um are you are you up to date with the value of the car Agreed, with yeah. insurance? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I just run it through uh, X Y Z, you know, right. the regular car insurance company. Oh boy! And I'm like, well, do you have agreed value? And they're like, uh, well, I mean, they'll, they'll take care of me. They're pretty good. And uh -huh. I'm like, oh, oh boy! So you start educating them. It's yeah. amazing how many people are out there sitting on the six figure collector cars that are just banking that the insurance company will pay them. Yeah, these you don't want to find right? out. You know, you were a bit naive and, and don't have the proper coverage for your car. So check that out. That's May 17th at yep. 8 p.m. Um, we've talked about PCA's Treffin at Sea, December 9th through 16th. Registration is open now. And in fact, a PCA member from the Las Vegas region with the same last name as me, he has registered and I'll be on the cruise with my dad. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so oh, he, wow. he and his wife have signed up, so that'll be pretty cool. Um, Treffin Gateway to the West registration also opens June 28th. That Treffin will be September 20th through 24th. It's an amazing facility, uh, so make sure you check that out. Read all of the um, options that you have for Treffin. They always sell out. And what I can tell people, you know, an insider is insider tip is to know exactly what you want, but get in there and you know as it opens get the basics that you want and then check out as soon as possible to secure your spot at Treffin because if you lollygag you know and start reading and debating which tours and stuff that you want to do and you go to check out 15 minutes later the event might be sold out or eight minutes later as as Robert just yelled into my ear so you want to be quick on that we actually sit at Robert and I said at his desk but we sit behind him and watch uh, registration open up and you can you see as the people are coming on to the system and the ones who understand how it works uh like boo said go in pick their things and are out super quick and other ones that are looking at it for the first time a lot of times don't get in because it by the time they go to check out it's all sold it's out all done so what we're, we plan on having um uh, some of the folks from uh, uh treffin uh on uh, at parade for the podcast so it would come out uh, i think the week that, that the podcast the uh, registration would open so just with a couple of hints and uh yeah so you, you want to listen to that podcast uh for those of you interested in going to gateway to the west 
All right. Anything else, man? Uh, happy birthday to Wolfgang Porsche. Oh, yes. Happy yes, 80th turned, birthday. 80th birthday. Turned uh, 80 years old. And uh, uh, Wolfgang Porsche, the youngest of the four Porsche uh, children and uh, that, the brothers. And he's still very active. Uh, he, he announced that I think next year he's uh, leaving the Volkswagen Supervisory Board. But he's still the chairman of the Porsche Supervisory Board. And he is responsible for really helping Porsche become what it's become. Uh, even though they have a CEO, Oliver Bluma, um, they essentially uh, report to the family, which is uh, what uh, the supervisory board is uh, made up of. All right. So, again, if you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like. We love reading your comments, so throw a comment. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe. All the newsletters we have available, just head to PCA.org newsletter. Sign up, eBreak, Performance News, Mark Fresh. It's all free for you. Thanks for listening. If you aren't currently a PCA member and you own a Porsche, grab that VIN, head over, and we'll sign you up. If you're looking to buy a Porsche, we have the Test Drive program. Remember to follow our podcast Instagram page, see behind the scenes photos and videos, Porsche Club Insider, all one word. As always, feel free to send us a message or email at podcast at PCA.org. If you want to stay in touch with all things PCA, remember to subscribe to the newsletters. And until next time, stay safe and we'll catch you down the road.